order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Paula Sheriff. Question number one, Mr yeah. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Paula Sheriff. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I previously worked in an NHS service which the Coalition Government gifted to Virgin Care, who are now seeking another contract covering my constituency. Amongst many unethical practices I witnessed, Virgin imposed a system of double appointments, forcing patients to have unnecessary extra consultations before surgery, boosting their profits at the expense of the taxpayer and of patient safety. Is this acceptable? And if not, what is the Prime Minister prepared to do about it? Well, of course, what we want to see in the provision of local services is the best services possible for local people. But the Honourable, the Honourable Lady talks about outsourcing of services in the NHS. I have to say to her that the party that actually put greater privatisation into the NHS was not this party, it was the Labour Party. Question, question two, closed question, Mr Michael Fabricant. Twelve months ago... I went to see this stage. Yes. <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the West Midlands economy, I have to say, is in a very uh, positive position at the moment. I'm very pleased to say that since 2010, nearly 200,000 more people are at work there, 42,000 new businesses. I saw the strength of the economy when I was in Birmingham last week. Of course, we're giving the West Midlands new powers with the devolution deal and the election of a mayor. And I have to say that Andy Street, with his business experience and local experience, would be a very good mayor for the West Midlands. Yeah. Mr. Michael Fabricant. On the subject of the NHS, 18 months ago, my wonderful doctor, Helen Stokes Lampard, suggested I have a general well man check up. And it's just as well that I did, because the blood test revealed that there could have been and was a problem with my prostate, despite the fact that I was symptom free. I was immediately referred to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, who are simply wonderful. And after a period of surveillance, I had a prostatectomy back in June. But hey, I'm now fine. (laughs) (laughs) But I want to thank the whole team at the QE, including my surgeon, Alan Doherty, and my excellent specialist prostate nurse, Richard Richard Gledhill, who gave me practical advice. But in the next 10 years, there will be a real shortage of specialist prostate and urology nurses, as many are due for retirement. So may I ask the Prime Minister, what can the government do to to avert a shortage of these much-needed nurses? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that a whole house is pleased to see him back in his position yeah. in, um, in, as his normal exuberant self in this, uh, in this house? But he raises a very serious issue. Uh, and can I join him in commending not only those doctors and nurses and other health service staff who uh, treated him for his prostate cancer, but those doctors and nurses who are day in and day out, ensuring that, as we see, actually, we are now having cancer survival uh, rates at a record high. The government is putting more money into awareness of cancer problems, uh, and we will look at those, uh, the training of nurses. There are 50,000 nurses in training, and we'll continue to make sure that the specialisms are available to do the work that is necessary in the health service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too join the Prime Minister in wishing the member for Litchfield well and obviously hope the treatment he got is the same treatment that everybody else got because we want, we want good treatment for everybody in our society. Um, it's not controversial, I'm just wishing him well. Is that okay? Sorry to start on such a controversial note, Mr Speaker. I do apologise. At the Conservative Party conference, the Prime Minister said she wants Britain to be a country where it doesn't matter where you were born. But the Home Secretary's flagship announcement was to name and shame companies that employ foreign workers. Could the Prime Minister explain why where someone was born clearly does matter to members of her Cabinet? First of all, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, congratulations on winning the uh, Labour leadership yeah. election. Yeah. And, and can, can, I, uh, can I 
welcome, can I welcome him back to his place uh, in this House as his normal self? Uh, can I say to him that the policy that he has just described was never the policy that the Home Secretary announced? There was no naming and shaming, no published list of foreign workers, no published data. What we are going to consult on, what we are going to consult on, is whether we should is whether we should bring ourselves in line with countries like the United States of America, which collect data in order to be able to ensure that they're getting the right skills training for workers in their economy. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am most grateful to the over 300,000 people that voted for me to become the leader of my party. Which is... uh, Mr Speaker, is rather more than voted for her to become leader of her party. Um, she, seems to be, she seems to be slightly unaware of what's going on. First, first, the Home Secretary, first, Mr Speaker, the Home Secretary briefed that companies would be named and shamed. The Education Secretary clarified that data would only be kept by government, and yesterday number 10 said it was for consultation, and the Home Secretary clarified the whole matter by saying it's one of the tools we're going to use. This government has no answers, Mr Speaker, just gimmicks and scapegoats. Yesterday we learnt that pregnant women will be forced to hand over their passports at NHS hospitals, no ultrasound without photographic ID, Heavily pregnant women sent home on icy roads to get a passport. Are these really the actions of a country where it doesn't matter where you were born? Mr. Well, I've, I've uh, made absolutely clear about the policy that the Home Secretary set out. But I'd just say to the right honourable gentleman, he raises issues around the health service. Uh, I think it is right that we should say that we ensure that when we're providing health services to people that they are free at the point of of delivery, that they are eligible to have those services. That where there are people in this country who come to this country to use our health service and who should be paying for it, that the health service actually identifies those people and makes sure that it gets the money from them. I would have, I would have thought that would be an un- uncontroversial view. Of course, emergency care will be provided when necessary, absolutely without those questions. But what is important is that we ensure where people should be paying because they don't have the right uh, to access to free care in the health service, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Some of her colleagues on the Leave side, Mr. Speaker, promises £350 million a week extra for the NHS. Um, She doesn't seem to have answers to the big questions facing Britain. On on Monday, the Secretary for Brexit, when questioned about the Government's approach to the single market access, replied, we need hard data about the size of the problem in terms of both money and jobs. It would have been much easier if he'd simply asked his colleague the Chancellor of the Exchequer, because he would have been able to tell him that the Treasury forecast is a 66 billion loss to the economy, 7.5% of the GDP. Can the Prime Minister now confirm that access to the single market is a red line for the government, or is it not? Well, the the Right Honourable Gentleman has asked me this question before, and uh, yes. He says it's a simple question and I will give him the simple answer. What we are going to do is deliver on the vote of the British people to leave the European Union. What we are going to do is be ambitious in our negotiations to negotiate the best deal for the British people, and that will include the maximum possible access to the European market for firms to trade with and operate within the European market. But I'm also clear that the vote of the British people said that we should control the movement of people from the EU into the UK, and unlike the Right Honourable Gentleman, we believe we should deliver on what the British people want. Uh, Someone once said that leaving the single market would risk a loss of investors and business and we risk going backwards when it comes to international trade. That person is now the Prime Minister and that was before the referendum. (laughs) The Japanese government, Mr Speaker, the government... The Japanese government, Mr Speaker, wrote to her in September worried about a shambolic Brexit. 
Many Japanese companies are major investors in Britain, such as Nissan in Sunderland, which has already halted its investment. 140,000 people in Britain work for Japanese-owned companies. They have made it clear that those jobs and investment depends on single market access. What reassurance can she give to workers today desperately worried about their future, their company and their jobs? First of all, say to the right honourable gentleman that the biggest vote of confidence that we had in Britain after the referendum vote came was £24 billion investment from a Japanese company, SoftBank, in taking over Arm. But secondly, in relation to what we're doing in our, in our negotiations, he doesn't seem to get what the future is going to be about. The UK will be leaving the European Union. We're not asking ourselves what bits of membership we want to retain. We're saying what is the right relationship for the UK to have to the maximum benefit of our economy and citizens of this country. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the member for Broxtow said there is a danger that this government appeared to be turning their back on the single market, which was indeed a commitment in the Conservative Party manifesto. The reality is that since the Brexit vote, the trade deficit is widening, growth forecast being downgraded, value of the pound down 16 per cent, an alliance of the Chamber of Commerce, Confederation of British Industry, British Retail Consortium and Trade Union Congress have all made representations to the Prime Minister demanding clarity. Is the Prime Minister really willing to risk a shambolic Tory Brexit just to appease the people behind her? What, uh, what the Conservative Party committed to in its manifesto was to give the British people a referendum on whether to stay in the European yeah. Union. We gave the British people that vote. They have given their decision. We will be leaving the European Union, and in doing that, we will negotiate the right deal for the UK, which means the right deal in terms of uh, operating within and trading with uh, the European market. That's what matters to companies here in the UK, and that's what we're going to be ambitious about delivering. Jeremy yeah. Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the right honourable member for Rushcliffe often has a mot just to help us in these debates. <laughs> and he simply said <laughs> you know, I want to hear about the right honourable and learned member for Rushcliffe. Very long way, Mr Speaker. And uh, what he said was in his own inimitable way. The reason the pound keeps zooming south is that absolutely nobody has the faintest idea what exactly we're going to put in place. We on these benches do respect the decision of the British people to leave the European Union. But this is a government that drew up no plans for Brexit, that now has no strategy for negotiating Brexit, and offers no clarity, no transparency, and no chance of scrutiny of the process for developing a strategy. The jobs and incomes of millions of our people are at stake. The pound is plummeting, business is worrying, and the government has no answers. The Prime Minister says she won't give a running commentary. But isn't it time the government stopped running away from the looming threat to jobs and businesses in this country and the living standards of millions of people? Unlike unlike the right honourable gentleman, I'm optimistic about the prospects of this country once we leave the European Union. I am optimistic about the trade deals that other countries now actively are coming to us to say that they want to do with the United Kingdom. And I am optimistic about what, how we will be able to ensure that our economy grows outside of the European Union. But I have to say to the right honourable gentleman on this issue, Labour did not want a referendum on this issue. We gave them, the Conservatives gave them a referendum. Labour did not like the result. We are listening to the British people and delivering on that result. And now the shadow, the shadow Foreign Secretary is shouting from a sedentary position. The Shadow Foreign Secretary wants a second vote. I have to say to her, I would have thought that Labour MPs would have learnt this lesson. You can ask the same question again. You still get the answer you don't want. Despite several rounds of European regional development funding, the Cornish economy 
continues to lag around 30 per cent below the UK average. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that Brexit provides us with the opportunity to develop our own economic programme that will be less bureaucratic, more effectively targeted and offer better, for value, better value for money for the taxpayer? And will she confirm that her government will continue to invest in the poorer regions of our country, such as Cornwall, once we leave? Yeah. I, I thank my honourable friend, and I can give him that assurance. And of course, we, uh, what I was saying at our party conference, what I've been saying since I became Prime Minister, is we want an economy that works for everyone. That means for every part of our country, including areas like Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. We've already uh, negotiated a devolution deal with Cornwall that was signed in 2015. That will demonstrate, I think, that we recognise the challenges Cornwall faces. But we're open to further discussions for Cornwall on ways in which we can improve their economy for the future. Angus Robertson. Yeah. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance has found that a number of areas of concern over political discourse and hate speech in the UK, as well as violent racial and religious attacks. Police statistics have shown a sharp rise in Islamophobic, anti Semitic, and xenophobic assaults over the past year. So, does the Prime Minister agree? that all mainstream governments and all mainstream political parties should do everything that they can to oppose xenophobia and racism. Yeah. I've been very clear from this dispatch box on a number of occasions. There is absolutely no place in our society for racism. There is no place in our society for hate crime. Yeah. It is right that the police are investigating uh, allegations of hate crime where, where they occur. I'm pleased to say that as Home Secretary, uh, I was able to improve the recording of hate crime, bringing the re arrangements that improve the recording of hate crime. We made uh, also improving the uh, requirement on police to specifically record uh, hate crime in relation to, to faith so that we see the uh, uh, anti-Islamic, uh, the Islamophobia that has been taking place, as well as anti-Semitism and other types of hate crime. It is, there is no place for that in our society. We should, with one voice from across this chamber, make that absolutely clear and give our police every support in dealing with this. Yeah. Angus Robertson. I remind the Prime Minister that when she was Home Secretary, she put advertising vans on the streets of this country telling foreigners to go home. And at her party conference, we heard that her party is wishing, wishing to register foreigners working in the UK. The crackdown and the rhetoric against foreigners by this government has even led to UKIP. UKIP yep. saying that things have gone too far. Can I tell the Prime Minister that across the length and breadth of this land, people are totally disgusted by the xenophobic uh, uh, language on display from her government? So will she now confirm to this House, will she confirm that the intention of her government is still to go ahead with the registration of foreign workers, but apparently we shouldn't worry because it will be kept secret by her government. Can I say very gently to the right honourable gentleman that I answered two questions on that earlier, and I suggest he should have listened to the answer I gave there. Mr. Kaczynski, your moment has arrived. Uh, we, we have empowered local doctors to take real leadership over important reconfiguration proposals. In Shropshire, 300 doctors, surgeons, and clinicians have been working on a vital reconfiguration of A and E services in Shropshire and in Wales. When they make their decision later this month, it is very important for government to back them and provide the capital funding required for this vital change to enhance patient safety. I, I think the, the Honourable Gentleman is raising an important point because the configuration of services in his constituency and for others across this House is obviously a significant issue. a and &E provision, I'm pleased to say, we're actually seeing more people being treated in A&E today. We will, of course, look at the proposals that come. The point about the way this is being done is it's for local people to be able to have their voice heard and for decisions to be taken that reflect the needs in a particular local area. We all want to see A&E services. Uh, they're a vital service. And I would just like to pay tribute to all those who work in A&E hospitals across the country. Yeah. Meg Hillier. Yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, the Public Accounts Committee and the Controller and Auditor General have both warned that the NHS budget is not sustainable. 
When is her government going to wake up to the reality of growing demand and avoid the political rhetoric and set a sustainable NHS budget for this year and for the future? Yeah. The government took a very simple approach to this. We asked the NHS themselves to propose their five-year plan for the NHS. We asked them how much money they required. They said eight billion. We're giving them 10 billion, more than the NHS said. Funding in the NHS is at record levels. The only place where funding in the where uh, money for the NHS is being cut is under a Labour administration in Wales. A young man with Asperger's syndrome awaits extradition to the United States facing charges of uh, computer hacking and is then likely to kill himself. It sounds familiar. Uh, he's not, of course, Gary McKinnon, who was saved by the Prime Minister, but Lowry Love, who faces, in effect, a death sentence. So when the Prime Minister introduced the Forum Bar to, in her words, provide greater safeguards for individuals, surely she expected it to protect the vulnerable, like Gary McKinnon, like Larry Love. The honourable gentleman, my honourable friend, obviously campaigned long and hard for Gary McKinnon, and obviously I took that decision because at that time it was a decision for the a Home Secretary to decide whether there was a human rights case for an individual not to be extradited. We subsequently changed the legal position on that, so this is now a matter for the courts. There are certain parameters that the courts look at in terms of the extradition decision, and that is then passed to the Home Secretary, but it is for the courts to determine the human rights aspects of, uh, of any case that comes forward. It was right, I think, to uh, introduce uh, the uh, form bar to make sure that there was that challenge for cases here in the United Kingdom as to whether they should be held here in the United Kingdom. But the legal process is very clear, and the Home Secretary is part of that legal process. Lennon Coker. What does the Prime Minister say to British steelworkers who have lost their jobs or whose jobs are threatened? Given the news that French steel is to be used for the new replacement Trident submarines, is that what she means by being a party of the workers? Well, I, uh, I have to say to the uh, right honourable gentleman that we recognise the concerns of British steel workers. That is why the government has been, under my predecessor, and is continuing to work to ensure that we can do what we can to uh, promote and encourage and retain a steel industry here in the United Kingdom. A number of measures have been taken. If he was, if he was in the chamber earlier, he'll have heard my honourable friend setting those out in Scottish questions. Mr. Philip Hollabout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctors and nurses at Kettering General Hospital are treating a record number of patients with increasingly world-class treatments. Yet, despite being located in an area of rapid population and housing growth, due to an historic anomaly, the local clinical commissioning groups are amongst the most relatively underfunded in the whole country. What can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, do to help address the situation? As my honourable friend says, I mean, of course we want to make sure that patients are experiencing the same level of high quality care uh, wherever they are, regardless of where they live and wherever they are. And that's why I understand that the funding for my honourable friend's local uh, clinical commissioning group this year is being corrected to more accurately reflect the level of need that there is in uh, local health need. And that's an investment of over £757 million that will be going into his local area. I think that shows the intention that the government has to ensure that we see that uh, health service that is working for everyone across the country. But of course, we can only do that with uh, the economy to back up the, uh, that NHS. Dr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware of that a soft border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic was vital in boosting the economy of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister understand the confusion that has set in and that many of us feel on going forward? On the one hand, the government defines the intention to tightly control free movement of people and labour, yet on the other hand assuring us that that border between Northern Ireland and the Republic will continue to be open. Does, she see the, does the Prime Minister see the contradiction for many of those who are directly affected and whose jobs are affected in that? Well, I have been clear, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has been clear, uh, the Taoiseach has also said that 
on both sides of the border, we don't want to see a return to the borders of the past. Uh, I think it's worth reminding the House that actually the common travel area has been in place since the 1920s. So it was there well before we were both members of the European Union. We are working together with the uh, Government of the Republic and uh, obviously I've had discussions on this with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister in Northern Ireland. We want to ensure, as I say, that we don't see a return to the borders of the past. Andrew Stevenson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thanks to the Government's growth deal, the £32 million transformation of Briarfield Mill in my constituency gets underway this week, giving a new lease of life to the largest redundant mill complex in Lancashire. Can I thank the Prime Minister for her support and commend Pendle's other bids in the latest round of the growth deal uh, as a great way to build a country that works for everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Can I commend my honourable friend on taking his opportunity to, uh, to support the bids that have been put from, uh, from Pendle. He's absolutely right that the money that has been put in has enabled this uh, uh, growth like Briarfield Mill to be unlocked as, a, as local projects. We've seen uh, £250 million committed to the Lancashire Local Enterprise Partnership, £2.8 billion to the Northern Powerhouse through the Local Growth Fund, and the latest round of funding is worth up to £1.8 billion, with good bids coming in from the, uh, from the local LEPs. So we're assessing the proposal including those from Pendle, and they will be looked at with the seriousness which my honourable friend would expect. Liz Savile Roberts. This is the first Christmas Hayley Aldirmaz of Putheli won't see her husband Hassan. They've been together for ten years and married for over four with two young children. It's evident they're in a long-term relationship, but Hayley's Turkish husband was refused a spouse visa in 2012 because she earns less than the Home Office threshold of 18,600. Indeed, Half the full-time workers of Duivo Merionith earned only £293 a week or less last year. And this, I might say, compares with the Prime Minister's own constituency, where the median salary was £571, almost £30,000 a year. Can the Prime Minister explain why living in Duivo Merionith means Hayley has less chance of a family life, a proper family life? And would she please help unite the family this Christmas? If I can say to the Honourable Lady, I, I won't comment on the individual case. I know she's sent uh, uh, details in writing to me. I will make sure that she gets a full reply from the Immigration Minister in relation to the specific case. Uh, the, issue, the broader issue she raises is about the income threshold for those wishing to join a partner here in the United Kingdom. Uh, it, the, what the Government did was we asked an independent committee, the Migration Advisory Committee, to advise on the level that that income threshold should be at. The Migration Advisory Committee uh, suggested a range of figures that it could be. We actually took the lowest figure in that range in taking the 18,600. They recommended that because it's the level at which a British family generally ceases to be able to access income-related benefits and to be able to support themselves and integrate into society. And, and uh, we believe it's important that people coming here are able to support themselves. James Cartledge. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, yeah. Yeah. My constituents were delighted to learn this week that Gainsborough's House, which is a unique uh, museum and art gallery based in the very building where Gainsborough was born in Sudbury, is to receive almost £5 million of national lottery funding to become a national cultural attraction. Will my right hand friend join me in congratulating Director Mark Bills and his team on their success? And does she agree with me that if in Suffolk we are bold and positive and we go for devolution, that we can look forward to much more of this sort of transformative investment in the years to come. Can I join my honourable friend in uh, commending all those who have been involved in the bid uh, for, at Gainsborough House and the uh, future that uh, many people will enjoy uh, visiting Gainsborough House in the future as uh, a result of the work that is going to be able to be done. I know the importance of the Heritage Lottery Fund. It uh, supported the Sta excellent Stanley Spencer Gallery in my own constituency, so I have seen uh, the impact that it can have. He is absolutely right. The point about the devolution deals is people coming together with that ambition for their local area can generate that sort of transformative investment investment that he is uh, talking about and of course uh, Suffolk is looking at the sort of uh, deal that they might uh, wish to have locally. Yeah. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, with Russian and Assad regime war planes bombing civilians in Aleppo at an unprecedented rate, will she join France in calling for those responsible for these war crimes to be referred to the International Criminal Court and will she re-examine with allies the feasibility of a no-fly zone to protect the Syrian people before it is too late. Well, we're very clear that uh, 
It is for the courts to decide where all war crime has been committed. We co sponsored, it was May 2014, when we co sponsored a UN Security Council revolution to refer those responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria, regardless of affiliation to the International Criminal Court. Of course, that was vetoed by Russia and China. On the issue of a no fly zone, this is an issue that has been addressed. Uh, you know, people have looked at this for a number of years. The scenes we see of the indiscriminate slaughter of innocent civilians are absolutely appalling. We want to see an end to that. But there are many questions about a no-fly zone. Actually, uh, who is it there to protect? Would it lead to Assad bombing people in the expectation that they would then move to that zone? How would you actually enforce a safe area there? Uh, who would do that enforcement? There are many questions that need to be looked at in uh, those sorts of issues. What we all know is that the only real solution for peace and stability in Syria is a political transition. And it's time Russia accepted that, that the future of Syria is a political transition to a stable Syria free of Assad. Fiona Bruce. At Middlewich High School in my constituency, the most vulnerable pupils and their families are impressively supported, pursuant to the school's motto of achievement for all. Will the Prime Minister confirm that under her plans for education and in a country which works for everyone, the parents can be assured that there will be the right school place for their child, whatever their ability? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thank my uh, honourable friend and for the example that she has shown of the work that is taking place in her constituency. Uh, the whole aim of the government's education policy is to increase the number of good school places so parents can have the confidence that their child will have a good school place and they will have the school place that is right for them. That's why we want to see universities more involved in schools, we want to see more faith schools being opened up, we want to see the independent sector uh, you helping the state sector uh, where, that is, uh, where that is sensible and uh, their expertise can help. And yes, we do want to lift the ban, which currently says that one type of good new school uh, cannot be opened. It's illegal to open uh, a new good school that is a selective school. We want to remove that ban so that pupils of all abilities get the opportunity. Tim Farron. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The, uh, the Prime Minister appears to have made a choice, and that choice is to side with the protectionists and nationalists who have taken over her party, as surely, as surely, as surely as momentum has taken over the Labour Party, she has chosen a hard Brexit. She has chosen a hard Brexit that was never on anybody's ballot paper, and she has chosen to turn her back on British business in the process. As a result. As a result, petrol prices and food retailers have warned of huge price rises at the pumps and on the supermarket shelves in the coming days. So when will she put the interests of hard-working British people ahead of an extremist protectionism that absolutely nobody voted for? Yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Gentleman asks about who we're siding with. I'll tell him who this government is siding with. We're siding with the British people who voted, who voted to leave the European Union. And it's high time the right honourable gentleman listened to the vote of the British people and accepted that's exactly what we're going to do. Victoria Printed. Does, does the Prime Minister share my sadness that the majority of Banbury's babies cannot currently be delivered as I was? in the Horton General Hospital, and will she join with me in putting any influence and any pressure we can on the Trust to encourage them to recruit the obstetricians we need to reopen our much-valued unit? Yes, I, I, I can say that I believe every effort is being made to fill the uh, vacant obstetrics posts at the Horton General Hospital. I understand those mothers who are uh, having a midwife-led delivery are still able to go to the Horton General Hospital, but for others, of course, they do have to go to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Maternity ser services are important to people, and uh, I believe the Trust is actively looking to ensure that it can fill those posts. What matters is a safe maternity service for mother and baby. Angela Eagle. <laughs> I think many uh, people across the House will be uh, 
reassured that the government accepted the amendment to the opposition motion uh, being debated later this afternoon, which guarantees that this House is able properly to scrutinise the plan for leaving the European Union before Article 50 is invoked. Can she tell us, will that scrutiny involve a vote? I have to say to the Right Honourable Lady that the, the idea that Parliament somehow wasn't going to be able to discuss, debate, question uh, issues around... was frankly completely wrong. Let me give her some examples. First of all, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union has already made two statements in this House. I believe four hours of questions followed from those. A new, a new select committee has been set up, which crucially includes representatives from all parts of the United Kingdom, to which will be looking at these issues. And only just over a week ago, I announced that there will be a great repeal bill in the next session of Parliament to repeal the European Communities Act. So Parliament's going to have every opportunity to debate this issue. Will Quince. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every year in the UK, three and a half thousand babies are stillborn. And I commend the government for setting the target of a 20% reduction by the end of this parliament and a 50% reduction by 2030. But in this Baby Loss Awareness Week, will the Prime Minister agree with me that we must do all we can to provide the best quality bereavement care for those parents that sadly lose a baby? Well, I, I say to my hon. Friend that I think he is absolutely right in this. I am pleased to say that the Health Secretary will be attending the uh, Baby Loss Awareness Week reception, which will be held in Parliament uh, immediately after PMQs today, and I would encourage other mem members to attend it as well. My hon. Friend is absolutely right. The loss of a baby must be absolutely devastating, and I am aware that there are people sitting in this chamber who have been through that tragedy in their lives. What is absolutely essential is that uh, the best possible bereavement care can be given to uh, parents at that very, very vulnerable and tragic moment in their lives. And that's why we have been uh, putting money into... To, uh, we've introduced dedicated bereavement rooms at 40 hospitals and we're investing, actually investing more in improving birthing facilities as well, because that's an important part. But that care and counsel for people who have lost a baby is essential, and I think we all accept that. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. On the 2nd of July, the Home Office were giving details of 178 children who are still stuck in the Calais refugee camp, but had a legal right to be here in the UK with their families who could keep them safe and protected. Given the delays in acting, what responsibility does the Prime Minister think this government has to the 18 of those children who have now gone missing? I say to the uh, Honourable Lady, far from not acting, actually the government has been working with the French government in relation to those who are in the camps. We have put extra resource into speeding up the process of dealing with uh, the uh, uh, claims that are there for unaccompanied children who are in the camps, and we have seen that process uh, faster, it's quicker, and more children coming as a result of that. This is alongside all the other work that we are doing in relation to refugees and to unaccompanied minors. And of course, crucially as well, working to ensure that we deal with the traffickers and the smugglers who are often in those camps and uh, who we need to make sure don't have access to children so, uh, for, the, uh, for the future. But we've speeded up the process and more children are coming here as a result of that. Jim yeah. Churchill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tomorrow is Secondary Breast Cancer Day. I would like to ask the Prime Minister to join with me in wishing these men and women well. But only a third of NHS Trust currently collect the data in this area. Would she agree with me that better data collection can inform diagnosis, treatment and the use of NHS resources across the piece and give better outcomes for all patients? Yeah. I, I, uh... I entirely accept the point that my honourable friend makes that better information actually gives you a greater opportunity to be able to address these issues. But can I also join with her in uh, commending and wishing well all those, as she says, both men and women who have suffered from breast cancer uh, and who, are, uh, who have come through that, as I know she has herself. Uh, there are others in this House in that position, um, but so many people across the country, and it's important that they do get 
the right care to ensure that they can come through that and see a bright future. Yeah. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night in this House, a huge number of MPs presented WASPI petitions from towns right up and down this country. So, will the Prime Minister now commit to overturning those mistaken 2011 arrangements and provide justice and transitional arrangements for WASPI women? The, the Honourable Lady should know that there are already transitional arrangements in place. We did make changes. We committed a billion pounds to lessen the uh, impact of the changes for those who were affected so that nobody would see a change by more than 18 months. In fact, it's 81 per cent of women will see uh, increases. There will be no more than 12 months compared to the previous timetable. The DWP did, after the changes in 2011, inform people of the change to the state pension age. And of course, as we look forward, actually women will gain from the new pension arrangements that are being placed put in place. It has been a long-standing issue about women's pensions, and women will see uh, better pension arrangements for them in the future by the cha- because of the changes the Government has brought in. Yeah, yeah. Rishi Sunak. Mr Speaker, I gather the Prime Minister gave Chancellor Merkel a gift of Wainwright's Coast to Coast book outlining this fabulous walk running through my constituency. Is the Prime Minister aware that the Coast to Coast is not, in fact, an official national trail, and would she meet with me to discuss my campaign to give this national treasure its deserved national status? I, I, I say to my honourable friend, as he knows, um, that I enjoy, uh, I enjoy walking as well. There are some fantastic walks across the United Kingdom. I haven't done the coast to coast yet myself, but maybe uh, uh, there isn't much time to do it at the moment. But, uh, maybe, uh, but I have to say to him that I think he probably knows that the decision about the, uh, the, the uh, designation of the coast to coast is one more appropriately uh, put to Natural England, and I'm sure he will be doing all he can to lobby Natural England on this point. Order. 